So let's begin. Um, I'm Toby Ford from AT&T. Uh, I'm Chris Price from Ericsson. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, a few things, just an update on um, AT&T and Ericsson's collaboration over the, uh, since the last summit, an update on how we've been going, and then uh, a few uh, things about OPNFV, uh, integration of ODL and uh, OpenStack to create a, one, of a, one of the key services that we're doing in, a, in the telco space, and then uh, some uh, final steps. So just to begin, I'm going to just uh, remind everybody about why we're here, and then give you some, uh, some context setting. For AT&T, you know, right now, we're in really a, in a real struggle. Uh, our, the demands on our network and, uh, and our services is growing dramatically. So over the last seven or eight years since the iPhone was introduced, we've had about 100,000% increase in network traffic. Uh, that growth cannot be maintained without us really addressing the cost basis and the efficiency that we operate at. And we have to, we have to make changes. And so that, in part, is about NFV and the transition from, from very specialized hardware to more of a disaggregated hardware software, open commodity software-based sort of approach. So that's, that's an important part of it. But also an important part of it for us is, is that we need to be able to make new services much faster. Uh, we can't be spending 18 months talking about it, 18 months making a business case for it, and then however long actually uh, building it and testing it. That doesn't work. Uh, some of the things that we've introduced recently took us, in some cases, six years from conception to implementation, and that's just not tenable. So, and we have now new competitors coming uh, nipping at our heels that are doing things in a much different way uh, and a much, much different cost basis. So we have to move faster. So one of the, the pieces in this picture of, of how we change uh, that I want to focus on today is about the delivery of a new service and integrating concepts of the network uh, together with uh, maybe what we think of as infrastructure as a service and platform as a service with OpenStack and actually making something real that way. And we're going to talk about uh, one of the services, the first things that we're doing, which is uh, network on demand and VPN as a service. You know, and people often talk about when we, we bring network into the equation, oh, it's just not possible. How, how can we possibly run 100 terabits of traffic over x86 boxes. Uh, in my view, it's inevitable. And we shouldn't be thinking, per se, about what we can do today and what we're limited by, but what, what Moore's Law and a few more cycles that are still left uh, in Moore's Law uh, are, have available for us in the next uh, five years. So in 2020, will you say the same thing about x86 boxes? I don't think so. Today, 100,000, uh, uh, well, 100 terabits of traffic I think can be run on top of about 50,000 servers. Uh, in that same time frame, I think we're going to see that number go down dramatically. And then you should think, uh, if we think about it that way, when we talk about running our current network at 50,000 servers, and maybe with the scaling, we maybe stay at that level. An Amazon data center today is 80,000 servers. They're dropping 100,000 servers a quarter. Uh, so clearly, we have to find new workloads. We don't have enough workloads for the demand that we have to compete with those types of entities, like a Google or an Amazon. And so it's just sort of a recursive circle. We, we have to be able to make services faster. So this is what we've all been, we've been talking about. And a lot of our partnerships, like at and strong partnership with Ericsson is all about is, is how do we make this, this real? So uh, over the last two summits, starting in Atlanta, we had had a sort of put this notion out there that uh, we needed help to make the NFV real on top of OpenStack. And then uh, we, we uh, presented uh, a number of items that needed to, uh, to change. And then in the Paris summit, we actually uh, demonstrated a, one of the first uh, kind of VNFs running on top of OpenStack. And then we identified uh, more gaps and then uh, more solutions that we'd come up with in the interim. And that today is going to be the same thing. 
so this was a chart that we started with uh, back in Atlanta. We kind of laid out some of the key uh, gaps that we have with OpenStack uh, back then that needed to be, to be uh, worked and solved for uh, to, to make it so that we could run VNFs. And in the interim, in Atlanta, we, did, uh, we made some good progress uh, with the, the Juno release. And then even since then, we've made more progress with the Kilo release solving some key problems. Certainly one of those areas is around networking and being able to, over these cycles, be able to, to process more, uh, more throughput, more, uh, and more functions, more service chaining through the, through the network this way. Also, as many people believe, you know, the carriers have a unique resiliency or reliability uh, need. I don't actually think of it as any different as than uh, a bank or uh, a large e-commerce site. They actually have the same expectation that their service is running all the time and at a highly performant way. But um, that there is certain notions of high availability that uh, the carriers have, and we needed to fill those gaps in that area. And I think we've. We've done a good job, especially in the scheduler, and addressing uh, some of the unique affinity needs that a VNF has. Then we've also added a number of things to this picture to, to add to security and, uh, res and, and restorability and upgradability to this environment. Now, that said, there's still, in this, over the last year, there's still something missing. And I, I feel like uh, there's aspects and uh, other software needed to actually build a platform for NFV. And that's where the open NFV effort has come uh, into fruition and has actually made great progress to augment this picture with aspects of networking, deployment, and other, other such things to actually make a more complete platform. And that's what Chris will talk about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about OPNFV. I guess, hands up if you haven't heard about OPNFV at this summit. We've been uh, sharing our story. Thank you, Ian. Um, so essentially, coming to what Toby was talking about, at the end of the day, what we want to do in OPNFV is, is take the foundation pieces, work them through, and then figure out deployment challenges, figure out networking challenges, uh, and, and build out so that, so that the platform becomes suitable for large countrywide telco networks. Uh, and the real idea here is, is a simplification of the management and utilization of those networks. Um, if we can't make it easier, we're not really helping solve the problem. Uh, from an OPNFV perspective, you can see on the right we have what OPNFV project does, and you can see on the left the basic architecture. And, and the basic architecture doesn't change. We, we're not here to reinvent anything. We're really here to try and bring things forward as quickly as possible so that we can start to get our applications running um, effectively on this type of platform. But, what three main things we do, build an integration, we try and get a platform together that has the components that we feel we need in an NFE uh, type deployment. Deployment and testing, we run continual deployment across, not get across, but we have 21 labs connected across the globe already for, for bare metal deployment. Um, and we work with new requirements and features, high availability, uh, fault management. You've heard a lot of this through the summit uh, as the OPNFE guys have come out and said, this is what we need to do, this is how we're trying to solve it. Uh, and Really what we want to do is get those into Liberty, reconsume them once they're in the Liberty release and bring them back into the platform and start deploying and testing and running our apps on that and then iterating again and again until we get you know, the types of performance and, and the types of behaviors that we really want to. Um, it derives very much from the Etsy framework. Anyone that knows the Etsy NFE ISG uh, reference architecture, this is a representation of it, essentially, that we're using in OPNFV. And, and the focus for us in the short term is this uh, NFVI and Vim layer. We just want to get the platform running. We want to get our methods and our procedures, figure out how to work upstream, get all of our, 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 get our house in order, if you like. Uh, and then we'll start to address other things in the, in the stack, other areas that need some, uh, some acceleration or development. Um, but for now, very much focused on the platform itself. Um, status to date, we have released one coming out uh, in the coming weeks. It's called Arno, uh, named after a river in Tuscany. Deploys an OpenStack, Open Daylight based uh, control with Ceph KVM, um, OVS of course. We have two deployment tools, Formant and Fuel supported, um, and, and that gives sort of an indication of what we're about. We're not about 
KVM being the right answer. We're not about open daylight being the right answer. We're about facilitating components to come in and help find the right answer in the community. So uh, the SDN controller, for instance, is one area where we expect to have a number of uh, controllers coming in. We have the open daylight as, as part of release one, ONOS as part of release two, uh, open contrail as part of release two, uh, already intending to integrate with the platform. Um, 21 integrated Pharos labs. Pharos is what we call our, our hardware uh, project. Uh, and moving forwards, we have started to establish something we're calling this the, the Compliance and Certification Committee. Um, and these guys are going to look at what it actually means uh, for us to have a platform. And we can cobble stuff together. We can say, now it works fine, now it doesn't work fine. But at the end of the day, uh, OPNFV sort of has to stand for something. And, and how do we? How do we establish a trademark? How do we establish what it means? And that's what this, this group is going to be working with. I'll pass it back to Toby. OK. So one of the uh, example VNFs, just a very simple level that, uh, that we're working on today, we're actually um, in field trials with right now, is uh, something that I think of as a VPN as a service. Uh, essentially taking a, um, you know, making a dedicated connection that has reservation and separation um, for a customer and expanding it uh, to include any of their offices or any of their clouds and then possibly also integration with third party clouds. Um, this type of service we do, we've done in the past with typical hardware routers and now those routers are changing to become more uh, virtual. So routers that can be um, uh, CPEs and PEs that actually can run uh, on top of uh, a cloud. And when we, we look at it, um, you know, for AT&T, we're actually doing a lot of work of setting up and pre-configuring the, the, uh, the facilities and the connectivity ahead of time. We're putting a lot of investment in laying fiber and, and especially the multi-tenant buildings and having them ready for this type of service. And then when we can do this in a more virtual way, we can spin up resources and spin up different types of services quickly as, as this evolves, hopefully it's may, maybe firewalling or different types of security services or different types of uh, maybe CDN or these types of things can be added to this type of thing uh, easily. So that's, that's an example of a service that we're looking at. And today in, in our networks, we use MPLS uh, pretty extensively to do this. Uh, we sell essentially MPLS as a service today. Uh, and so what we're looking for is to extend that kind of notion uh, from our clouds into our customers' data centers. And then Chris will talk about the more so, the specifics that way. Yeah, I guess from, from a, a conceptual perspective, what we set out to achieve when we, when we started working with AT&T was to figure out, okay, how do we deploy uh, you know, a BGP stack with, with uh, MPLS capabilities on top of an SDN solution in a data center? Uh, you want to be able to basically abstract it off uh, the physical switches, so, so SDM forms a, a key component of that. And we put together uh, essentially a demonstration um, or a proof of concept and have since then been moving on bringing that out in an upstream communities, trying to, trying to expose it to the community for consumption um, and essentially bring it forward to OpenStack so that we have a mechanism to, to start to deploy you know, um, VPN services on tet layer to tenant networks. The, the way we've done it is today, because we only have ML2, if, if you look at the orchestrator function on the right, we talk to the OpenStack, and we use the ML2 to set up the tenant network. And then we kind of have to bypass OpenStack, and we go straight to the, to the ODL SDN controller by REST to spin up the VPN services. And then that will uh, essentially, as you bring up tenants in the network, uh, they will be uh, notified by OpenFlow, form a part of the network, chained into the network, uh, and then we will advertise by BGP to the data center gateway that these tenants are now available to be routed to. Um, and that's, I guess, at a high level, how we sort of bring it together. Yeah. The key being also that the routers themselves along the way are uh, running on OpenStack clouds. Yeah. Ah, OK. So to sort of walk through that process, uh, again, if, if you're coming into OpenStack and you want to deploy a new service, uh, we're starting to work with OpenStack. We have a review tomorrow morning on a BGP VPN. Um, a blueprint that we're, we're trying to promote in so that we can we can actually bring this into the community but if you start from the top you know I want to deploy a new service then okay we create a network we create a subnet 
um, and then we're sort of at that ML2 level, then, then we need to create a VPN. Uh, the VPN, it's kind of a new object. What, what you need to identify here are, are the, the import route targets and the export route targets for that tenant, uh, potentially a route distinguisher, but that's a longer discussion. Um, and then your, your, your WAN VPN name and your uh, MPLS network and router subnet construct. After that, you create a port, and then you essentially attach that port to an image. You boot a VM. When you boot the VM, the port will notify via OpenFlow to the controller that it exists. Uh, the OpenFlow controller will then push, push rules into the network in order to establish that as part of the tenant network. And then you'll actually, from the, uh, from the, the router, the virtual router, you will expose BGP rules to uh, the gateway in order to route to it. And so the process of, of enabling this is not so different than what we do in OpenStack today. We just have another layer in between. And then there's this, uh, the BGP stack essentially coupling us directly. Um, the plugin architecture, I'll go pretty quickly through this, but in general, the ML2 plugin exists. The L3 VPN plugin is what's under discussion uh, at this summit to really try and bring in. Um, the way we're implementing it is in open daylight. So we have the ODL mech driver. Uh, we need to add uh, layer 3 support for the L3 VPN plugin to the ODL mech driver, and then it will drive down to the open daylight controller so that we no longer need to bypass uh, and go directly to the northbound interface of Open Daylight to get the VPN services in place. We can do it directly through OpenStack when we create the network. Um, if you have a look at how this works, um, essentially your operator admin, he'll create the VPN, create the external networks, and then the tenant will create a router, uh, connect the router to the external network, and then as you create the internal network, expand it or, or, or contract it, uh, the router will essentially publish those endpoints to uh, using BGP. Um, I won't go into the details of the API. Can you talk us through this one? Sure. So in the end, uh, essentially, um, in each of these regions, whether or not they're in our data centers or in our customers' facilities, then we've created essentially the, we've replicated virtually what we would have done before with PEs and CEs uh, in the MPLS scheme. Um, so a little more technical detail from, from the OpenStack ODL integration view, just from the pure mechanics of software and how we're going to be putting it together. Um, on the OpenStack side, you have the API layer, and then you have the plugin layer. Under the plugin layer, we have a mech driver, and the mech driver is there to basically translate the plugin directly into what Open Daylight expects to see. On the Open Daylight side, we have, we have something called a Neutron Services. Um, Open Daylight exposes REST conf interfaces natively, um, and they're not natural for OpenStack to consume. So we have a Neutron Services um, function, which essentially exposes a, an OpenStack compliant interface, which then will talk down to the BGP, the FIB, layer 2 services, uh, and including service chaining as needed. Um, on the Open Daylight side, what we've been working with over the last six months is essentially the red spots in the middle there, the VPN management, next hop manager, multipath BGP components, um, FIB service, and, and label management service. Uh, as mentioned today, they're invoked via the northbound interface of Open Daylight, but we hope to, to wrap them up under the OpenStack Neutron service uh, once we get that capability in OpenStack. Um, until OpenStack can speak to us, we can't really listen anyway. So this we have to do in parallel. And that's the planned activities, I guess, for uh, moving beyond the Open Daylight Lithium to the Open Daylight Beryllium release. Uh, we'll be essentially formulating that so that this just happened naturally as part of integrating with, uh, with OpenStack. Yeah, right on. I think that's all I have. Yep. Yeah, so um, that's an example of one, uh, one type of VNF and, it's, uh, and how we would go about integrating it with Open Daylight and OpenStack. Um, so I'll talk further about one of the, uh, the, maybe the next frontiers of work that we have to do in the space. Um, traditionally in uh, the telco world, there was a lot of uh, infrastructure, software infrastructure, OSS infrastructure around this thing called policy. Uh, and essentially, policy is um, I have this constraint or expectation, and I want to make sure that the infrastructure lives up to that expectation. Across a telco and its VNFs, there are many, or any of the network functions, there's a lot of these types of expectations and rules that we want to make sure are complied with. And they, they can on one end be things around performance or availability, you know, some number of nines. They can be about some amount of uh, throughput through a, through a particular flow. They can also be very much about security and uh, assuring some level of 
you know, is the thing uh, encrypted? Uh, is it authorized? Who can do what uh, on these kind of uh, connections? Make that into something that, uh, so those expectations then get processed and then in a sort of tops down way get manifest in some level of configuration or um, state monitoring or configuration monitoring system that is maintaining that um, and maintaining that expectation or policy. So that has been a, a, a long tradition in, in telcos. And now we have to take that and uh, make that real within, within OpenStack and within the OPNFE context. So a lot of work has to happen still to make this happen. And so that's why we're quite excited about something like a Congress, uh, which is helping to, not just with OpenStack, but with other things, uh, sort of uh, create a definition language for this policy and then help us to propagate it into the enforcement points of, of the systems. Uh, so that's an exciting effort that way. And then there's also a number of other uh, interesting tools out there. And there, there's a great debate, right? Uh, can you just add policy after the fact? Uh, go into all of the different systems and then and make sure things are uh, as you expect. Uh, that's one way and very likely the way we have to do it for some time because that's, it's all, it has been an after the fact issue. Now there's other systems and I'm and then, uh, quite excited about what uh, folks at Epsera have done in this way where they started with policy at the beginning as the first class thing, as a, it's the basis of the whole system and then everything that was built around it in container management and PaaS uh, around policy. So I think this is another sort of a uh, tidbit from the telco world that we need to sort of digest in the, in the open world. Yeah, so just as a summary, we showed uh, some of the aspects of what it takes to deploy an L3 type of VPN and uh, as a VNF, and then some of the enhancements needed across the, uh, the continuum of OPNFV, and then uh, introduced this, the policy concept. Um, further next steps, we need to continue to enable, to enable uh, VPN integration uh, and distributed layer 314. What we're doing now is, is, is very much a first step. It's an enabler, it's a proof point. Um, we know we have technical debt to carry forwards that we have to keep promoting and bringing out through the community. Um, we have an OPNFV proposal which is really going to look at that over the longer term. Um, we have in Open Daylight the VPN services project, which is also looking to evolve and bring forward those technologies. Uh, and in OpenStack, you know, we have our first blueprint up there that we're working with with, with a number of, uh, number of others in the industry. And we hope to continue to, to, to find the right parts of that networking component to bring up into OpenStack uh, so that we can, we can get what we need out of the tenant networks. Right on. And uh, actually, one note on this, too, that I uh, I really like about the OPNFV website and the wiki is the community pages uh, that kind of bring together and bring your focus to, uh, let's say for OpenStack developers, uh, what needs to happen or a list of items that are, are kind of our focus point in the OPNFV community that we're trying to upstream and get make real. And also to help the developers with guidance about how to do that uh, for each of these projects because it's somewhat unique across all the projects we're talking about. And, and giving guidance, uh, we think, is a helpful aspect of OPNFV. We hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a little bit about what we're doing then. You can see the, the, the darker areas are activities which, which we're working with customers and collaborators in OPNFV, which we're targeting to bring upstream to OpenStack. Um, there are other areas which, which we haven't really exposed as OPNFV requirements yet, but we know from a telco as, as we're trying to do what we're doing. Um, for, for, for a number of years now, before the inception of OPNFV, we have activities that we're trying to bring forwards. Um, as we bring them through, of course, we'll be consuming them back into the open platform and, and demonstrating them and sharing them with the others. But uh, just from a perspective of where we've come from, here you can sort of see the areas that we've been focusing on and, and those which are uh, exposing themselves through the OPNFV channels as well. Um, we hope to see all of this coming out through OPNFV uh, as we get it into OpenStack and start to consume it downstream again. Um, I'd just like to give a little overview as well. Um, Ericsson is one of those application vendors. We make VNFs. Um, they have traditionally been made as monolithic functions sitting on a big piece of metal. Um, 
We're, we're, we're working extremely hard to try and bring them into the cloud environment. As you see, the requirements that come from us are because we're trying to do this and trying to walk this path. And we need to work with the OpenStack community to help us understand what's the best way to solve this. And then we take that back to our application developers. But as part of that journey, we've been downstairs working on demonstrating, showing what we're up to and where we are. Um, some things are just coming through now. They don't have the great performance we need and the, and the resiliency. Others are, are far more advanced. Um, and there is a list. And I won't flick through them, but for anyone that's interested in these types of things, uh, on the web page, there will be a list of all the demos that we were showing, and, uh, and you can sort of click to the movies and have a look if you'd like to see what we're up to. Right on. All right, I think that's it for today. Uh, yeah, this is from another there. presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. The, uh, anyways, do you, any questions for us? Yeah. Feel, feel. Go ahead, Mike, please. Yeah, yeah. that'll be great. So you gave the example of layer 3 VPN as a service. Have you looked into layer 2 VPN as a service, and do you intend to in the future? Um, that hasn't been our focus or our area, but uh, we know it's of interest to others, so yeah. That's yeah, I mean, from Ericsson, yes. So is the goal eventually to really convert each of the existing services that you have on physical networks today to? Yeah, I mean. The areas, the VNFs that we're focused on right now, so I'll just give you some, some sense of it. I mean, there's certainly a lot of the voice uh, services, SIP, which is a challenge in and of itself uh, around IMS and U the universal services platform, all those things. That's one area. Uh, there's also the packet core aspect of, of moving bits between your phone and others' phones and your phone and the internet and such. That, that whole system uh, is, probably our highest priority right now. And then uh, alongside of that, there's a lot of things that are really applications that go along and augment the, the various mobility services. And then um, we'll see what happens with uh, DirecTV, but uh, certainly the TV space is going to get uh, cloudified here as well. Yeah, so the question is, why would we do some and, and not others? I mean, there's, uh, you know, in telco world, there's business cases to be had and done. So we have to really justify what, and, and it's non-trivial. But uh, there's some that are really obvious uh, that would help us. And then others, maybe not so obvious. So there's, there's that business sort of prioritization. And then others, you know, there's skepticism still whether or not it's doable or not. You know, some some areas... Uh, are clearly doable with this type of VNF model, and others, uh, there's some skepticism. So that, yeah. that also impacts our priority as well. And I think it's also difficult to, to make a judgment call that, okay, uh, virtualizing everything and putting in general in, in, in data centers is going to be answer to all of our questions. I mean, traffic growth is, is, is not slowing down, and I don't think it will slow down, and maybe maybe all the initiatives and innovation occurring in the silicon space comes through and we start to see some silicon options that we would actually like to take advantage of that, that will help accelerate again. Uh, so, I mean, you it's never know. A, it's it's always a balance. Cycle. And, and you, it's, it, you can't just say this is how it is from now on. I mean, that's never really been, been an option. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so a question about um, SDN controllers. Uh, I've heard in other talks mention of controllers at, say, different levels, like a global controller or a local controller. So when you talk about adding support for other controllers in the second release, are you thinking of them playing different roles, or are you thinking of multiple controllers that could all play exactly the same role, or how do you envision that? Good question. Um, Thank you. We can blame that lady over there for why exactly. there's been You can, you can go to the back thing. of the queue. <laughs> um, so, so, so all controllers are not equal, right? Um, and it's, it's from an OPNFV perspective, I mean, right now we're just doing ML2. We, we, we don't have a lot of stuff in the OPNFV platform right now. We've just really used it as a developmental way to get ourselves off the ground more than, more than to say, here's the answer to everyone's prayers. Um, moving forwards, we hope to create an environment where we can bring in different controllers, where those controllers can essentially show how they solve problems in the network. And, and OPNFV at a macro level 
needs to look at, for instance, how it peers with other data centers, how it peers, uh, how, it, how it aggregates into the data center from, from, uh, from a, a wide uh, aggregation network. And, and this is the use case level that we really want to be looking at. Now I can use different SDN controllers to solve those problems in different ways, and then I can actually see how effective that is for the applications that I'm trying to, trying to deliver. Um, and further to the point, uh, an application is not equal to any other application, and some applications might like one controller better than they like another controller because they happen to be architect in a certain way that takes advantage of the benefits of that controller. So there's no, there's no winner and loser, um, and, and there is a quality at a macro level, but if you try and measure a quality at a micro level, you start, to, you start to make everyone look exactly the same, and that's not what we want to happen. I hope that answered the question. And then no, no, another... No, another gonna, feel free. Yes, I was going to add. So, um, yeah, since we created this term, this is too high for me, but... Um, so yeah, so actually to add what Chris was saying, um, we, the reason why we came up with a, a local control is because we're finding that there's network elements that um, are diverting in different architectures and which is causing controllers to be very specific to that. So we give examples like you have a virtual router in the hypervisor and we're finding you need a specific type of controller for that. We're finding when you start doing leaf spine, you might have a different type of controller for that. And then I, I can even go on. We're, we're actually working on an open rotum. Um, this is the optical world, and there's controllers that are going to be specific for that. And so that's why we started realizing you can, uh, that's why we started using the term local controller. And, and then, of course, we, we call the global controller was really the open daylight. But the point is you've got all these controllers, and then you have all these different um, industry open source controllers that are all saying they're going to be the controller. And our view from an AT&T point of view is we are good or bad, using all these controllers for different reasons. And we're noticing they're coming from different uh, sweet spots, different types of core competency, if I call it that. And they all want to be the controller. And to us, it's not obvious they can be. So that's why we started doing this whole global and local. And then we'll see in a year or two if it really can all merge or you just need these specialized controllers, if I call it that, the local well, controllers. From, from experience, specialized <laughs> functions do a specialized job much better than a general function. So. <coughs> Yeah, horses for courses. Well, the telco world and the IT world both have uh, no shortage of overloaded terms. <laughs> yeah, Prakash from FutureWay, just to uh, get away from SDN debate, to the policies. So in policies also you've got uh, fixed networks and mobile networks, wireless networks, different kinds of networks. Sure. So how do you, have you thought about or what's your take on the policies from point of view of different uh, types of networks, mobile network, fixed networks. How do you want to address that, at least looking going forward? Well, one part of it is I don't like redundancy, and I don't like having two or three different domain-specific policy managers. I'd like to see something that was as common as possible across the domains. Uh, but clearly, whether it's you know wired access or wireless access, they're going to have some unique aspects uh, and when it comes to what the expectations are and what's possible. And those expectations, when they're manifest in policy, they'll be different. So it's, there'll be some level of domain specific in that, in that realm. Thank you. Can you expand a little bit on what you have in mind from a telco perspective of VNFHA as well as what we have in mind from OPNFE point of view? Uh, yeah, I mean, VNFHA is my, one of my favorite topics. I mean, today, many of the VNFs show up, and they come from a vertically scaled mindset because they were trapped in a box, uh, and that box had to be vertically scaled to some extent. Now, there, that's probably a bit too harsh because many things, like routing, was one of the first things that was truly horizontally scalable. So uh, it's not entirely true. But a lot of the VNFs that we've worked with uh, come to this picture with bias toward vertical scaling. So getting them to break out to be more horizontally scaled into what I call the midget cattle model is, is, a, is, a, is a trick. Uh, we're having to do a lot of work to convince people to do that way and, and rely more on application level uh, diversity across many sites too. I mean, now, there's a difference, there is a truly a difference between a large website and one that's distributed across many locations and then access types of services because typically we don't dual home 
the access to your, your house, right? So there is a single point there. And so in those cases, there's a limit to what we can do uh, when it comes to true horizontal scaling. And so then, then that kind of the circle still goes back to some level of, of making that one access point as resilient as possible. So there's, there's going to be a mix. But the ideal is obviously to make, and this, make this as much cloud-like as possible. I'd, I'd chime in and add that at least in my experience in the last 12 to 14 years when we've been doing applications, we've been doing them horizontally scalable anyway. Um, the challenge there is that we've been doing them horizontally scalable on proprietary platforms. Um, and what the mechanisms that we use are coupled to the hardware. So you still end up with a vertical scaling even if you're horizontally scaling and the mechanisms that you have been using don't necessarily um, fit into a, a cloud architecture. And, and from, from that perspective, it's, it's even for the horizontally scaling applications which are capable of doing that, they still need to learn to adjust to the capabilities that are available in a cloud environment. Um, or you have to deploy your middleware as a pass over the cloud environment, which adds overhead, which is unnecessary. And, and this is a, it's a journey that we have to take. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I know this is a layer three uh, into a neutron discussion. And you talked about uh, the interdata center um, layer three VPN as one of the VNFs. Are there other VNFs uh, that you can share with us that uh, priority? in terms of the ones that you expect to be deploying? Um, yeah, like I was mentioned before, anything related to the uh, network, L3, uh, L4 plus kind of functions, firewalls, load balancers, uh, IPS, IDS, any of those things are fair game for, uh, for being VNFs, and they've already been that way for many things that for a while anyways. But, uh, what I think is interesting is how they become part of the SDN, part of the service chain, and maybe reduce the overhead of packet processing in many locations. So that's, uh, and maybe find the right balance of, of, you know, what's the right number of places to do, uh, maybe label switching or maybe uh, opening the packet up and doing something with it. So that's the opportunity of the future in that space. But obviously with, in the telco world, uh, the packet core, all of the three GPP kind of uh, functions, the IMS, the USP, all of those things are, are fair game for this space as well. Uh, so SIP-based traffic as well as, uh, you know, um, uh, and in, in our world, the TV space, encoding, uh, moving, moving uh, content around, that, that whole space as well. But for us, mobility is a priority. And, uh, and getting more value out of our wired uh, kind of assets is, is high up there. So. Yeah. And we have a new toolkit that we haven't mastered. I mean, yes. it's going to take a little bit of time. Yes, um, more on the general OPNFP question. Um, I saw many different requirements discussed in many different um, projects. And through this week's session, I learned that their level of achievement is quite different between projects. And my question is that, on the other hand, you're going to release the first um, Arno release soon, and there are going to be uh, periodic releases. And the question is, what, what are the relation between the projects and the releases and the requirements? Are, the, you know, are they going to be listed in each release, which requirement is included? Or, uh, and what is the life cycle of the project? I mean, what, what is the goal of the project? Is it the goal is to include it in the open stack, or is it included in your release in the kind of um, Okay, so so I will answer it holistically, and hopefully you can derive from that. If there are any gaps, you can let me know. But so so we have this concept of a requirements project, and the requirements project is really to address a need we see on the platform. Um, the requirements projects have the the task of trying to work upstream with whichever. Uh, upstream community helps them solve those problems. Um, and our requirements projects are going through their first iteration of attempting to work uh, with upstream communities. Um, the way we've approached the problems in some cases fits really smoothly into those upstream communities. Uh, sometimes we've approached the problems in a way where we need some feedback and then we have to iterate on, okay, maybe there's a better way to approach the problem and the solution to the problem. Um, and as you, as you say, some have been extremely successful, some not so successful. Um, this is, uh, again, we're, we're not eight months old. 
um, our requirements projects are doing this for the first time. Um, we intend to, after this activity, essentially recoup, come together and, and discuss what was successful, what wasn't successful, why wasn't it successful, share that information with each other and then try and find a, a more successful model as we move forward and constantly iterate and improve. Um, what the requirements projects should deliver is the ability to execute a capability on the platform. Um, so requirements projects really intend to work in upstream communities so that we can reconsume that and, and fit it together to, to form an end-to-end -end use case. Um, if I was to start a requirements project which said I need to be able to press a button to turn this light green, then that project would probably last one iteration. If I was to start a requirements project which said I want to deal with high availability in an OPNFV architecture, I would expect that project to last a long, long time um, as we iterate and as we improve. And, and so uh, how long the projects last really depends on their scope and it depends on how quickly we're able to arrive at a, at a desired state. Um, and even then, the project might not disappear because may maybe there's usability concerns, maybe they start to work up the stack rather than down the stack. Uh, it's, it's difficult to really claim a project um, would, would disappear at any given time. If it's an important area, it's an important area f from now on, if you like. Um, are you actually taking this uh, L3 VPN to production and will it coexist with your current L3 VPN service so that you have a brownfield type solution where some endpoints come, and come in on your existing L3 VPN and some endpoints can come in on this new L3 VPN? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, uh, this is going, something that we're putting out there. And uh, yes, we have a brownfield problem. Uh, there's no doubt there's going to be uh, a long, arduous process of sort of transitioning from old services to new ones this way. I mean, it's, and that's one of the bigger problems that we have to deal with, is having coexistence of, of old platforms with new ones. All right. Is it beer I think that was a lot of uh, a lot of questions. Oh. <laughs> uh, now you're getting in the way of beer. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Have Thank you, everyone. Thank you.